beekeeping industry is in crisis over the shocking and unexplained deaths of hundreds of millions of bees over the last eight months. For years, Australia was a lone survivor, the only continent without the deadly parasite that ravaged honeybee populations around the world. While beekeepers in Europe and the Americas struggled with their collapsing bee colonies, Australia was a sort of sanctuary. But in mid-2022, everything changed. A microscopic invader slipped through the nation's tight borders, and within months, the unthinkable began to unfold. Something was killing the bees. Fast. What started as a local scare quickly scaled into a national crisis. But what happened next, just one year later, wasn't a collapse. It was something far bigger, stranger, and more surprising than anyone expected. Let's unpack what went down. For many years, honeybee populations around the world were under siege. From North America to Europe and some parts of Asia, beekeepers watched colonies disappear. Sure, there were multiple reasons, like overusing pesticides, habitat fragmentation, climate shifts, and last but certainly not least, parasites. But chief among such parasites is the Varroa destructor. It's a parasitic mite so powerful that it affects entire beekeeping industries. Its spread caused a widespread colony collapse, as well as a spike in pollination costs. Additionally, it increased dependence on chemical interventions just to keep the beehives alive. But through it all, one place remained untouched, Australia. Down under, there are really strict biosecurity laws. Due to such laws, island geography, and rapid quarantine response systems, Australia was able to keep the Varroa destructor out of their borders long after the rest of the world fell to the mites' terrors. By the 2010s, it became the only continent still free from the mites. Now, this wasn't just a scientific curiosity, it was a big national advantage. Without Varroa, Australian beekeepers didn't have to micromanage their hives or face the catastrophic losses seen elsewhere. Basically, it meant they spent less, there were fewer chemical residues in their bee products, and also less regulatory burden on growers who relied on pollination. This benefit made Australia's bees critical, not just domestically, but also globally, in bee research. Australian hives became similar to reference points. They kind of modeled what healthy colonies could look like. So many industries, like the almond, macadamia, and blueberry industries in Australia, needed bees. Prior to 2022, some researchers had raised concerns that the varroa mite could eventually be detected in Australia. In mid-2022, their concerns came true. On June 22, 2022, Australia found its first case of the Varroa mite. It was discovered during a standard inspection at the Port of Newcastle in New South Wales. The long-feared mites finally made it to Australia, clinging to a European honeybee colony near the shipping terminal. Australia moved fast. They declared a 10-kilometer eradication zone around the detection site. Thousands of hives in the zone were put under movement restrictions. Furthermore, the beekeepers were ordered to stop transporting hives. They had to destroy any colonies infected with mites and conduct mite surveillance. The goal was clear. They had to find every mite, eliminate every possible means of escaping, and stop them from spreading before it got worse. Truthfully, it was an urgent operation. Think of it like contact tracing during a disease outbreak like the plague. Biosecurity teams made use of hive movement records, swarm tracking, GPS mapping, and even reports from citizens to find colonies they suspected to be compromised. Teams in protective gear went to many properties, inspecting brood frames. They euthanized any colonies that looked suspicious so the invasion wouldn't spread further. It was really high stakes. Moreover, public awareness campaigns got broadcast on various media channels. People held town meetings, too, so everyone knew what was happening. In addition, emergency permits were issued for destruction of hives. The operation grew so big that it shocked many people, especially hobbyist beekeepers. The authorities encouraged people to stay calm and emphasized that this was simply a containment effort, definitely not a crisis. But beneath the surface, officials were afraid. No country till date has managed to successfully remove the Varroa destructor once it set its feet in its borders. The detection at Newcastle gave enough reason to believe that the mites already slipped through Australia's borders, maybe weeks or even months earlier. What's worse is that the port is super close to commercial beekeeping zones, urban gardens, and natural forage areas, so it was a no-brainer the mites would spread. And unfortunately, they did just that. As the weeks went by, there were more mite detections in regions close by. Simply put, the infected zone map got bigger. 
It stretched across coastal communities inland toward heartlands full of agriculture, and now concern turned into dread. What started as a single point incursion began to grow into something way larger and much harder to stop. The nightmare had arrived, and it was only just beginning. Now, what exactly is this might that's causing so much havoc? Well, to the naked eye, the Varroa destructor doesn't look like much. It's a reddish-brown mite as tiny as a grain of sand, but for honeybees, it is one of the deadliest parasites on Earth. Originally native to Asia, the mite evolved with the eastern honeybee, which developed defenses against the mite as time progressed, so the mite couldn't harm the eastern honeybee anymore. However, by the 1950s, the human population began moving western honeybees eastward, allowing the Varroa mite to feast on new prey without the evolutionary defenses to fight them off, and from there, things got pretty bad. Basically, Varroa mites eat the fat bodies and bee blood of both adult bees and developing larvae. This feeding in turn weakens their immune system and makes them extremely vulnerable to viral infections. One of the most destructive is deformed wing virus. It basically deforms their wings, so they can't fly anymore and they become useless to the hive. Infected colonies sharply decline as sick bees fail to get food, defend their hives, or even care for their brood clearly demonstrating how dangerous the Varroa mites can be. However, the ripple effects of their damage isn't limited to one insect species. It's not just about what it does to bees, it's also because of how fast it does it. Within weeks, an infestation balloons out of control. If untreated, a healthy hive collapses in less than a season and two to three years in temperate climates. Scary stuff. The Varroa mite is known to affect wild honeybee populations in lots of regions like parts of North America and Europe. As a result, many commercial beekeepers use chemical treatments to manage the effects of the parasite, but even with these tools, there are still plenty of losses. Australia had been spared that grim reality until 2022. And this outbreak didn't just threaten honey production, it threatened entire food supply chains. After the first detection at the port of Newcastle, Australian authorities launched one of the most aggressive biosecurity responses in the country's agricultural history. At first there was hope, but the Varroa destructor quickly proved to be a formidable threat. It spread quietly, moved quickly, and adapted with remarkable resilience. Now, the mite spread in ways that were unpredictable but also insidious. Beekeepers, many of whom were unaware their hives were infected, had already moved their bee colonies across regions for pollination contracts. Additionally, some hives were split or sold before the detection went public, so in a matter of weeks, Varroa outpaced the very containment lines meant to stop it. The parasite is tiny and often hidden within brood cells. It also escaped early notice in many apiaries, slipping quietly through the cracks even when there were so many careful precautions. Worse still, the biology of the mite worked against detection. Sounds strange, right? Varroa reproduces inside capped brood cells, so it's totally invisible during surface level inspections. Adding to the difficulty, the mite doesn't eradicate outright. By the time all the symptoms appear, it's often too late to fix it. Unfortunately, environmental conditions helped accelerate the invasion. Australia's warm climate and extended flowering seasons kept hives active nearly all year. This provides almost constant opportunities for mites to reproduce. By late 2022, the situation changed dramatically. Maps from the Department of Primary Industries showed infection sites much further than Newcastle. The containment zones became a sprawling patchwork of red. It was bad. Surveillance teams were overwhelmed. New detections popped up in distant regions with no clear epidemiological link to the original outbreak. Yet there was more bad news. Wild swarms and feral bee colonies turned into mobile reservoirs of infection. They quite literally carried the infection. These unmanaged bees could not be tracked, treated, or quarantined, so Varroa gained a strong foothold in the wild. It was clear that the containment efforts failed. The battle that followed was no longer about stopping the invasion, it was about surviving it. As the Varroa destructor ravaged New South Wales, Australia's biosecurity agencies upped their response. It was war. By mid-2023, the operation turned into one of the most expensive pest control efforts in Australian agricultural history. A shocking amount of around 101 to 130 million Australian dollars was committed to the National Eradication Program. The strategy was simple but brutal. Seek out, 
isolate, and destroy every single infected hive within the red zones. By July 2023, about 30,000 hives had been euthanized. In some cases, entire apiaries were wiped out in a single day. Beekeepers had to destroy their colonies, burn equipment, and ground all operations. Some of them complied reluctantly, others resisted and argued that since the eradication effort already failed, destroying healthy hives was futile. Moreover, the toll on the economy was absolutely insane. Australia's honey industry, which valued at over $150 million annually, stalled. But the larger concern was pollination. Almonds, blueberries, and apples are among the crops that are often pollinated by honeybees. In situations where pollination is reduced, crop output can vary. The 2023 almond season was seriously disrupted by hive shortages, as well as transport restrictions and confusion over biosecurity rules. Farmers and beekeepers found themselves caught right in the middle of containment protocols and commercial survival. Insurance didn't cover losses from the bees. Compensation schemes were slow and sometimes inconsistent. Protests even broke out, especially among small-scale and hobbyist beekeepers who lost almost everything. For many, it wasn't just the end of their hives. It felt like the loss of their identity. Others reported increased stress, anxiety, and even depression, especially those in rural communities where beekeeping was a core part of their lifestyle. At the same time, government and research bodies began to quietly acknowledge the truth. Simply eradicating the bees wasn't realistic anymore. Despite massive funding, containment lines kept failing too. Yes, the war was still on officially, but its days were numbered. Something different needed to take place, and it was already on its way. By September 23, it was crystal clear. With all the biosecurity operations set up, the Varroa destructor couldn't be contained. The mite had already spread beyond control. So in September, the New South Wales government made it official. They were abandoning the eradication strategy. Now shifting from eradication to management was a big turning point in history. For the first time, Australia accepted that it had to live with Varroa, the way every other beekeeping nation did. Now the battle was with individual hives. Beekeeping practices were changed completely. The national plan shifted to Integrated Pest Management IPM. Commercial beekeepers started learning how to detect mites. Also, biosecurity authorities launched education campaigns, webinars, and so much more to help apiarists grow the skills they'd never needed before. Furthermore, miticides were introduced under strict regulations with guidance from researchers. Everyone had to adapt but the change came at a steep cost. Thousands of hobbyist beekeepers left the industry because they just couldn't or they weren't ready to deal with everything that came with controlling Varroa. It was a very difficult time for beekeepers. It was the end of an era. But regardless, a new chapter began, and it didn't come with eradication, but adaptation. The shift would soon bring surprising results. Consequently, Australian beekeepers began their era of management. Still, many of them feared that Varroa Destructor would ravage hives unchecked, but what happened surprised everyone. Some of the bees began fighting back. In regions with Varroa present for several months, beekeepers slowly noticed subtle changes. Some colonies groomed mites off each other more aggressively. Others began to remove infested brood cells before the parasites reproduced. These aren't random quirks. Rather, they're part of a known set of traits, Varroa sensitive hygiene, VSH, and grooming behavior. In addition, in countries where Varroa was endemic for decades, these traits selectively breed into honeybee lines. Now, Australian researchers and commercial breeders have started doing the same thing. Programs sprang up to identify and propagate queen bees from resilient colonies. These bees weren't immune to Varroa, but they showed they were able to resist naturally as time went on. Another unexpected ally came from the native bees. Australia has over 1,700 species of native bees. Although they don't produce commercial honey, some of these species help to pollinate crops. Also, they don't get affected by Varroa destructor, so while the managed honeybee numbers fluctuated, some farmers turned their attention to these native bees for help. And fortunately, this helped to make agricultural systems stronger. Researchers also explore biotech solutions, including RNA interference, probiotics, and biocontrols. Regardless, these are still experiments. As a whole, these natural and strategic responses meant there was a big shift in mindset, from fighting to coexisting, and from crisis to opportunity. 
In just a year, the results of that shift were absolutely dramatic. Mid-2024 marked a full year after Australia officially shifted from eradication to management, and at this point, everyone could see the vision. Varroa Destructor had taken hold, yes, but the worst-case scenario didn't come true. In fact, something new is rising steadily. Despite fears of bee colony collapse, many beekeepers report that they were able to manage mite levels. With regular monitoring and careful treatments, the beehives were surviving and in many cases they thrived. Bee losses were still higher than before the mite infestations, but they were lower than what everyone predicted they would be. Very importantly, pollination services resumed, although a few things changed. The 2024 almond season went ahead with a smaller but more coordinated supply of hives. Farmers worked more closely with beekeepers, too. In some areas, native pollinators picked up where things were slacking, and their efforts got boosted by new conservation efforts, together with habitat plantings. The beekeeping industry, which at a time braced itself for collapse, now found itself undergoing a quick evolution commercial operators adopted new protocols. Additionally, they gained more technical skills and formed closer partnerships with researchers. Queen breeding programs got bigger, too. They focused heavily on varroa-resistant traits. Meanwhile, large-scale agriculture saw the event like a wake-up call. The government increased funds for pollinator research and other practices. Moreover, the public got more interested in bees. So with this new interest, community efforts began to plant pollinator-friendly gardens and reduce how much pesticides they used. So by July 2024, Varroa Destructor was no longer the unknown enemy, it was a known threat. But the story doesn't end there. As of mid-2025, Australia's response to Varroa has entered a new phase, resilience building. Several states, including Victoria and Queensland, have now launched real-time mite tracking apps that allow beekeepers to log infestation levels, treatment cycles, and hive health. This data is being pooled into national databases, helping researchers spot regional patterns and predict outbreaks faster than ever before. Moreover, a major breakthrough came when Australian scientists, in partnership with European labs, began field testing a probiotic blend designed to enhance bees' immune systems against varroa-transmitted viruses like deformed wing virus. Early trials are promising, showing increased survival rates in high-pressure zones. Even more surprisingly, urban beekeeping has seen a boom in cities like Sydney and Melbourne, where rooftop hives are not only surviving, they're thriving, thanks to diverse forage and reduced pesticide exposure. These urban colonies are now part of new queen breeding programs aimed at maximizing genetic resilience. In short, what began as a crisis is now transforming into a science-led revolution in beekeeping. Australia isn't just coping with Varroa, it's helping rewrite the global playbook on how to coexist with it. In conclusion, Australia didn't just survive the mite invasion, but it learned how to live with it. The country lost a lot, but they found a way to continue. What do you think about the Varroa Destructor? Leave your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to hit like and subscribe for more videos like this.